I have the wonderful pleasure of introducing to you um, Amy Jecker Jones, who is a coordinator for the Community Science Program at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. She joined that program in 2018 and works on the City Nature Challenge, both at the local and international level, and also on the Backyard Bat Survey as well. Amy received her California Naturalist Certification at the Dominguez Rancho Adobe Museum in 2015. That's also where I got my certification in 2019. So shout out to any DRAM alumni on the call. Um, a shameless plug, DRAM is hosting their CalNAT course uh, coming up September 10th. So please let anyone know who's interested in the LA area if they want to get certified at Dominguez Rancho Adobe Museum. Um, that is coming up quick. So I am now going to hand it over to Amy. Amy, thank you so much for being here and you can take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Elliot. Um, I'm really happy to be here today among so many California naturalists and climate stewards. This is just the best audience I can think of to um, have an opportunity to speak to. So before I start talking about the City Nature Challenge, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a brief, brief background of um, my journey to becoming a naturalist and to working on the City Nature Challenge. As Elliot mentioned, I am a coordinator in the Community Science Program at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. If you ever want to reach out to me, my email address is right there. Feel free to take a screenshot, take a photo with your phone. I, I welcome contact with all of you. When I was young, I was really blessed to have a tremendous amount of access to nature. We had a family cabin in the mountains that um, we went to all the time. And really, even today, I actually live in the foothills of um, the Pasadena area because I want to be close to our local mountains. Um, it's just the, it is my happy place. And even when I'm tooling around town and I hear, smell some of the pine trees that we have growing in our neighborhood, it transports me right back to those mountain communities that I feel like I grew up in as a child. I also was really blessed to have a grandmother who would take me to lots of different parks and natural areas to explore. And then just on my own, I played outside in the yard a lot. Um, digging my own swimming pools, uh, making trails through weeds that, that grew in the backyard as tall as my head, it seemed, for a small child, and actually trying to build my own bird's nests out of weeds that I would find in the yard, and I would shape in a bucket with water and then put up in a tree, hoping that something would find it. Of course, it never did. And fast forward to high school, I was given an opportunity to join um, a rec recreational leadership certification program. And that actually led me to learn about um, the Orange County Outdoor um, Science School. And I was then, as, as a college freshman, as I finished my year up there, able to work as a substitute outdoor educator for the last couple months of the year. And that was just the best experience. And at that point, I actually really considered making um, the life of a naturalist the career that I might pursue. But um, I, and I was specifically interested in botany because those are the courses that I was teaching um, during the program. But there was, I just heard that the botany professor at my school was mean and I just got afraid and I never took a class. So I'm just encouraging everybody out here today, if there's something that you even think about pursuing, take that risk, go for it and see where it might lead. Um, I've had a great life, but you'll see that my path to becoming a naturalist in the end is actually a little bit sideways with some different um, non-traditional stair steps because I decided to go ahead and keep up my art major instead of transferring to the natural sciences. So after um, school, I realized I was not a creative genius, but I was a really good administrator and organizational person. And so I took those skills to work in event planning and did that until I had my second child, in which case um, I actually left the workforce for a full 10 years to be home with my children. And I want to say that 
um, I recognized that I had tremendous privilege in those early outdoor opportunities that I had and the opportunity to actually stay home with my children for 10 years um, that not everybody has. Um, and during this time, I noticed this funny insect in the backyard and really didn't know what it was. It looked like an orange and black alligator, but there was something instinctual inside of me that made me think it could be a ladybug. And so I started researching it and determined, yes, it was a ladybug larva. And that led to me starting to photograph pretty obsessively all the ladybugs in my backyard. I think I documented about nine different species just in one tree in my backyard. And of course you can't stop there. I would started photographing wildlife wherever I found it, but I really wasn't sure what to do with this rekindled interest in nature that I was experiencing. And I didn't really have an outlet for all of the photographs that I was taking. And that leads me to 2015 when I discovered the California Naturalist um, Program and got my certification at Domingo's Rancho Adobe Museum, which is just one of the best um, decisions that I ever made. And from there, I, that's when I first learned about what California Naturalist Program was calling citizen science at the time. And in my office, you'll notice I'm the community science coordinator uh, because we use the term community science for the work that we do. But I just really fell in love with that and with using iNaturalist. I've really finally had an outlet for all of those photographs that I was taking. And I felt that each one had the potential to make a real contribution to science. I wanted to see at that point, was becoming a naturalist going to be an avocation for me or did it actually have the potential to become a vocation at this point? So I started just making small tests. The first one was joining the California Naturalist Program. The second one was starting to volunteer at the Natural History Museum. And I got to volunteer in a couple different areas behind the scenes as well as on the floor. And then in 2017, I started volunteering for the Community Science Program and actually joined them on staff in 2018, specifically to work on the City Nature Challenge. So the way that I see my recent journey. It's that I, there's a direct line leading from the California Naturalist Program to my work on the City Nature Challenge, which I'm definitely grateful for to this day. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit more about the City Nature Challenge. I know that some of you in this um, audience um, are actually people I know and have been really instrumental in the Los Angeles area. And it's so exciting to see you here today. For those of you that may not be familiar with the City Nature Challenge, it is an international effort where people all over the world make observations of nature in their cities during a four day period. It began as a competition and now we're treating it a little bit more collaborator collaboratively, um, realizing how much each individual in each city can, contri can contribute to a whole. Some of the goals of the City Nature Challenge are to connect people to local nature in urban and metro areas. I have to move my screen just a minute. Connect people to each other to build community in person and online around local nature. Grow volunteer biodiversity documentationally globally. Have fun through some friendly competition or collaboration. And to collect urban biodiversity data that are available to managers and scientists. The City Nature Challenge began in 2016. And it was the brainchild of Leela Higgins, who is the senior manager for community science at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and who I work for, and her counterpart at the California Academy of Sciences, Allison Young. And the two of them decided to have a fun competition where they would see which city could record the most nature. And um, at that point, it was about a week long process that they did. And I actually got to, I, although I wasn't working at the museum at the time, I got to participate in the first city nature challenge because that love of iNaturalist I spoke about um, 
started getting me a little bit of attention. And iNaturalist and a group of power users actually reached out to me and said, hey, we want to win. Will you participate in the City Nature Challenge and make as many observations as you can? And I can remember even getting an email on the last night when you could make identifications saying, we, we need to do more, we need to do more. So sitting in bed with my laptop, frantically identifying as many observations as I could make. And that year ended up being a tremendous success. We had over a thousand people um, and more than 19,000 observations were made. In 2017, um, the City Nature Challenge really garnered a lot of attention from that first challenge. And a lot of cities around the country were really interested in participating. So it became a national challenge at that point. We had 16 cities who participated and more than 4,000 people made over 125,000 observations. 2018, the City Nature Challenge grew even further. And it's the first year we, that we became an international event with 68 cities participating. More than 17,000 people participated and we made more than 441,000 observations. 2019, the just continued to grow with even more cities around the world participating and 963 observations being made. And this point is down to the four day period. So that is a lot of observations being done in a very short amount of time. And then 2020, really threw us and everybody else in the world a curveball. And we had to um, really figure out with basically a month's notice being sent home from our jobs at the museum to work in our homes, we thought for two weeks, um, cancel all of our in-person events. How, we were, how were we going to continue to engage the um, Los Angeles population and our worldwide population in the City Nature Challenge. And we just started doing a lot of virtual events around that. And that's when we really started to shift our focus away from a competition to more of a collaboration. And 2020 is the first year that we didn't actually report city winners for each category of observations, species, and people. Because we really, we knew that COVID-19 was hitting some areas much harder than others. And there were severe lockdowns on. So we really asked people to focus on making observations in or near their homes, in their own neighborhoods, if it was safe to go out and um, walk. And we had some cities actually had to leave the challenge that year because with the circumstances in their cities, they just weren't able to do it. We even had organizers, both locally and internationally, who lost their jobs or were furloughed during that time and had to pull out of organizing. But surprisingly, we had new cities say, hey, can we join? And joined us actually at the last, um, just at the very end of it also. 2021 is significant for the year because this is the first time that City Nature Challenge actually crested 1 million observations in the four day period, um, which was just an amazing success. Um, the number of countries that we had participating at um, that time was 44 and 419 cities. So um, it's been just a great experience to see how people have adapted to constantly changing circumstances and really continue to focus on engaging with nature in specifically urban environments. And that brings me to this year's City Nature Challenge, which happened at the end of April and the beginning of May. We made 1.7 million observations this year and had more than 67,000 people um, participating. And this year, more than 50,000 species were recorded, including more than 2,244 um, rare and threatened um, species. And then one of the, that's one of the real things that we see happening with the City Nature Challenge is that a lot of observations come in documenting these rare and threatened species, which is very useful to land managers and conservationists. And this year we had 445 cities and our um, country total was 47. You can just see here how it has grown through the years. Um, and it's been really exciting to see from the beginning 
and be part of it now for, I've been on staff for, I think, five years of City Nature Challenge, just to be part of that growth. We also see a trend of massive growth in iNaturalist. Most of our cities choose to use iNaturalist as their platform for collecting data, um, including Los Angeles and most of our US cities do that as well. We also have a number of cities who use platforms that um, their scientific researchers and their public with, are more familiar with in other countries. This year, we also piloted a program in which we used an aggregator and some US cities even took part in that so they could contribute both eBird data and iNaturalist data. And so you can see a spike there in iNaturalist usership for each city nature challenge. And what's fascinating about this is that we really feel it's contributed to growth in use of iNaturalist as a whole, because every year new people are joining the city nature challenge and not everybody sticks with it, but a portion do that draws um, up the general usage of iNaturalist. This year was no exception to that as we had um, that almost 1.7 million observations, you can really see how that spike that happened in May. And just to compare, that's about where we were with um, our spike in 2021. As you can imagine, putting on something like this that um, involves so many countries um, so many cities around the world, so many different cultures, so many different languages is a tremendous worldwide effort. And I want to give all credit possible to Leela Higgins and Allison Young for founding this challenge and for spearheading it for the last seven years. On our team at um, the Natural History Museum, also working with Leela and Allison on the City Nature Challenge is myself and Sam Tyag, who may have joined our call today. Sam joined us at the end of last summer, has been really wonderful in working on the City Nature Challenge. They produced a handbook for us for the first time and did some really lovely interviews with organizers, um, basically acting as case studies to help other organizers um, you know, share knowledge about how to do this. So Elliot mentioned that you might be interested in just a little bit of a peek behind the scenes of the nuts and bolts of what it takes to organize the City Nature Challenge. So here's kind of a basic timeline. For us at um, the Natural History Museum and the California Academy of Sciences, City Nature Challenge um, is pretty much a year round event there's always something that we can be doing for it. And as soon as one season ends, it feels like it's time to start planning for the next one. But for a lot of our organizers, um, the ask is not as much as that. So generally in September and October, we have information sessions and our first global planning calls. November and December, cities begin organizing, um, choosing a platform that they're going to use and making their project and also reaching out to partners in their local communities to collaborate on plans. January through March involves training people to use iNaturalist or the city's chosen platform, planning events for around the City Nature Challenge and beginning to publicize it. In April and May, the City Nature Challenge happens and June through August is an opportunity for organizers to rest, to reflect on their successes, begin analyzing data and gear up for the next year. We just recently conducted a survey of organizers for 2022. And as with all surveys, it's opt-in and it doesn't have, it doesn't necessarily reflect the full spread of all of our organizers. But one of the things that we asked them about this year is whether organizing the Signature Challenge is part of their paid work or if it's a volunteer position. And you can see here that the majority of people um, actually do get paid for their work organizing the Signature Challenge, but there's a huge 36.9 percentage of people who volunteer their time to organize. And then those other smaller categories generally break down into paid or unpaid work, but that was an opportunity for organizers to self-describe how um, their participation is handled in terms of pay or volunteer. Some of our organizers, for instance, in Maui, have a single organizer on the ground that does the whole thing themselves. 
Um, other groups like Los Angeles, we have three people in our office that work on City Nature Challenge um, with additional staff members and many different departments at the museum also lending a hand and collaborating. And we also reach out to many different local partners to help us in this work and to collaborate. In Los Angeles, we usually have about 25 to 30 different organizations, um, environmental organizations, governmental agencies participate in this. I think Washington DC has something like 40 different partnering organizations that they work with. Another thing we wanted to ask organizers this year is about what language they primarily speak because we both institutions are in California, in the US where the predominant language is English, but we know we have an international audience. So one of the things that we do to reach our audience members, even though the percentage there is showing fairly low for Spanish speakers, that is just a reflection of low participation in this particular survey. We actually have a very strong presence in um, Central and South America. And so one of the organizers there, Annabella Plos from Argentina, has really stepped up on her own in, to volunteer her time to hold meetings in Spanish for anybody who would like to join those, translate materials into Spanish for anybody that um, needs that. And, you know, in the future, we really want hope that we can push this even further to really be working with people in the languages that they, um, they speak. And then here's just another chart showing some of the other languages that people mentioned they are comfortable conversing in. So as I mentioned, it's been seven years of the City Nature Challenge and seven years of the City Nature Challenge in California. Con counting all of our California projects across all seven years, we have contributed 563,435 observations to iNaturalist, almost 11,000 species, and more than 24,000 people participating. In the California this year, I think we had six main projects, and then we have one project called our Global Project, which is a catch-all. If you don't have a City Nature Challenge in your particular area, you can join this members-only um, City Nature Project and still contribute and be a part of this event. But in, So in California, this does not count the contributions of the Global Project, but just those um, California-organized projects. More than 175,000 observations came in, 6,000 species, and more than 6,000 people participating. So some of the cities that participated, and in California, they tend to be more like larger regions, counties, or several counties, instead of one individual city. So we had the Inland Empire participating, Los Angeles County, where I work. Mendocino County wasn't with us this year, but they did participate in 2021 and I believe 2020 as well. Orange County, Sacramento region, San Diego County, San Francisco Bay Area, and then this is the global project that I mentioned that anybody can join if you're not in one of our regularly organized areas. So since I'm speaking with you today, California naturalists and climate stewards, I really wanted to dig into the data a little bit and take a look at your participation in the City Nature Challenge and your contributions to it. Um, the way that I did this is by looking at the many projects that are on iNaturalist specifically for the California Naturalist courses. And there are so many that I will tell you what I'm showing, sharing with you today is really just a taste. I wasn't able to make a list of every California naturalist um, to compare it to usership in our, um, among all of our cities. But this I think is already showing some significant findings. And I know that this is probably low estimates of the true participation of California naturalists. So we see that in, um, Comparing the number of California naturalists who rank in the top 500 for their projects to the total number of people for those projects, we have anywhere from 0%, it's really a fraction of a percent for um, 
all California cities combined, about 1% for our global project, and then actually 18% for um, Mendocino County. And what I was tracking this against is the top 500 observers for each project. And the reason I used that number is because it's the maximum number of people that iNaturalist actually shows um, the results for in a given list. I also felt it was probably an appropriate number to use because although some projects are smaller, like Inland Empire, where they had just over 500 people and Orange County had under um, 500, Mendocino also, we also have some larger um, participation, Los Angeles County, San Francisco Bay Area. And I would say in past years, San Diego County has also had a huge number of people participating. And then I wanted to look at the number of observations that were submitted by California at Naturalist and find out actually how much of those um, observation numbers we had in comparison to all the observations made for each project. And then this is where I think we really begin to see the contribution by California naturalists. Um, in the Inland Empire this year, 13% of observations were uh, in the top 500. Or wait, sorry, I'm going to rephrase that. 13% of observations were submitted by California naturalists who ranked in the top 500. In Los Angeles County, we had 22%. Um, for 2021, Mendocino County was actually 48%. Um, Orange County, 4%. Sacramento Region, 45%. San Diego County, 5%. San Francisco Bay Area, 24%. And for that global project, California naturalists were participating with 3% of the total. And that global project, considering that it includes people all over the world, 3% is actually a pretty good number um, comparing it against the total number of observations. And I really do feel this is undercounting California naturalist participation. If I ever get the, the opportunity to do a deeper dive into this, I'd really love to do that. Digging into iNaturalist data is just one of the most fun things that I can do. So I was really glad to be able to do this, kind of share how your observations matter. And then this is just looking at the California um, for all the, I think it's for all the years, this one right here, showing the top 10 species. And you just really see some familiar faces, some familiar plants that are common throughout most of the state. So now I'd like to go ahead and dive into some observations specifically that came from California. So in our, Sandy, or our Orange County um, challenge, we had an observation of a Ridgeway's rail, which is near threatened according to the IUCN red list. And the Inland Empire reported an orange-throated whiptail. And the observation, the observer mentioned that this um, looked like he they were um, witnessing mating behavior between these lizards. And I don't know enough about coastal whiptail lizards to know if that's the case or not. But I know that our museum actually has a long running project specifically geared to tracking mating behavior of alligator lizards, where they do engage in this bite um, and coupling behavior that can last for a pretty extended time. And the orange threaded whiptail itself is imperiled in California and the US. San Diego County found the San Diego thorn mint, which is um, noted by the California Native Plant Society to be um, rare, threatened, or endangered in California and elsewhere, and actually seriously threatened in California. San Francisco Bay found a Western willow clearwing moth. And this particular observation was only the third observation of this species in the San Francisco Bay area on iNaturalist, and it was the first one to occur in the South Bay. Here in Los Angeles, um, iNaturalist user Velodrome um, observed a San Gabriel Mountains Dudleya. This is um, endemic in LA County, and it is considered seriously threatened in California. Mendocino County, going back to 2021, there were actually a couple observations of Button's banana slug. This one was made by Brooke, who probably a lot of you know, and is considered um, imperiled in the United States and as endemic in California. And then I want, there are 
it's actually hard to narrow down observations to talk about because there are so many amazing observations from all around the world. So I'm just going to toss in a few of those as well. La Paz, which did tremendously well in the Nature Challenge this year, um, had an observation of a Bolivian racer. It's endemic to Bolivia, and there isn't actually a lot known about its natural history and distribution. Um, the organizer for their challenge said that they have been, um, in 20 years of research, this observation was only the fourth record of it occurring in the La Paz Valley. And in coastal North, North Carolina, there was an observation of a Venus flytrap, which you, like me, may be most familiar from, from grocery stores or other stores that sell them in small little containers that you can take home, but have never gotten to see growing in the wild in their natural habitat. And this flytrap is actually under consideration for listing in the U.S. endangered species list because of habitat loss and poaching. In Hamburg, Germany, there was an observation of a bryony ladybird. And um, organizers there say it was the first record of this species for Hamburg, and it seems to be the northernmost observation of it. Um, so they believe it is indication that it's spreading further north, and this might be possibly due to climate change. And even in the midst of war, people were participating in Ukraine, and we had an observation of this I don't know how to say it correct. I'm going to try Przewalski's horse, which is endangered on the IUCN red list. So I'm going to take a few minutes just to talk about the impact of the City Nature Challenge. And I can see that I'm running a little bit on short on time, so I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. Talking, to, talking back to those earlier goals that I mentioned, connecting people to their local nature and urban metro areas, um, Fairfield and West Chester, West Chester County organizer says, I want everyone to understand there's amazing wildlife wherever they are. While it's great to check out nature preserves, parks, et cetera, I hope the CNC either inspires folks to check out those spots in their towns or really get out and explore or discover wildlife in a place they never expected. In Prague, they say, it was such a fantastic way to learn more about plants and animals that I see often, but couldn't name and didn't know anything about. It's also great to connect with other people in my area participating in the City Nature Challenge. Connecting people to each other, build local community in person and online around local nature. In Maui, there are a number of remarkable NGOs. Many of them have a limited focus, such as a single, single traditional fish, fish pond or a single wetland area, a particular section of coastline. And so the organizer there, and this is a case where it's a single man who's organizing the whole project, has really gotten um, a lot of different groups involved to network and meet each other, and has resulted in broader community organization and collaboration. In San Francisco, someone says the best part of the City Nature Challenge was working with others in person and virtually to put together a picture of biodiversity in our environment. It also made me a much more knowledgeable observer of nature around me. Collecting urban biodiversity data that are available to managers and scientists. In Surrey, BC, uh, Renata says, the main focus of creating our place in the INAT universe was to get a better idea of where species at risk and biodiversity indicator species from our con biodiversity conservation strategy were occurring. Eventually, we hope to use this info in a biodiversity atlas for the city and report out annual metrics on BCS indicator species. And in Melbourne, the eight Melbourne councils involved in the 2021 CNC collaborated with Melbourne University to create a research project that assessed the increase in density of observations and species diversity in Eastern Melbourne, more, sorry, Melbourne as a result of the CNC and community participation statics. Growing volunteer biodiversity documentation globally. Our Cape Town organizer reminds us that the impact of the CNC is not confined to just the period of the challenge, but even after that, um, species that were not observed or that were not um, weren't great observations um, are visited afterwards by people who want to find out more and make even more observations. And they also mention that 
the identification period, those things that are easiest to identify often get identified at a very quick rate. And after we officially end the challenge, um, identification still goes on. And these really hard to identify species um, may be a small piece of the puzzle, but they're often some of the very exciting things that we see. And in um, Bolton, somebody says, I went to the school for a week and did instruction and helped the children in grades one, four make observations, smashing success. And some people continue to have fun through friendly collaboration and competition. Um, in Idaho, they actually created this challenge where there was a trophy given to um, this person who had, I think, the most number of observations um, per capita to make at least one observation. And they had this model of Sassy the Sasquatch that they hid in various locations around their region. And then you would get a prize if while you were out making your observations, you happen to spot Sassy the Sasquatch. And in Rio Branco, Brazil, they say, I like CNC because the event is an opportunity to work and have fun with tens of thousands of people around the world with something common to everyone, biodiversity, life. I want to encourage every one of you to participate in next year's City Nature Challenge. We've already announced the dates. They are April 20th or 28th to May 1st. If you are, live in a region that doesn't currently participate and you're interested in organizing, that you can use that link to sign up and we'll get you involved in our information sessions this September. Again, feel free to take a picture or a screenshot of this slide. And if you live in the Los Angeles area and want to connect with us at the museum and everything we're doing in Los Angeles, please feel free to reach out to me for that. Um, Elliot, I'd like to do a quick time check now. I was going to go into um, iNaturalist and just do a little bit with identifying, but I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions as well. We've got, uh, yeah, we got about 20 minutes left until we're all wrapped up. So if you do have, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, but I think we can hang on to them towards the very end, Amy. Um, so yeah, if, if you have more to go over, I, I think you should just keep on going. Okay. Amazing so far. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to iNaturalist. And this is the project that we have set up for all California cities during all years. And as our South African um, organizer mentioned, Identification is a part of the City Nature Challenge that doesn't always get as much attention. And it's an area where people participating don't always have as high a level of comfort as they do with making observations. So it's something that I really like to um, teach people about. And I will tell you that I am a generalist. I don't have specific taxonomic knowledge in any area, but I have a pretty good general knowledge about a lot of things and I'm constantly getting better. So you can go into this project, or you can actually start anywhere in iNaturalist by clicking on identify at the top. I'm going to go and head into this project, click on the identify button. And this brings up all the observations that still need to be ID'd. And a couple of things that I really like to talk about with um, making a foray into identification, because this is really a great way to take your INAT usage to the next level, is to play a practice for one thing um, and use filters. So when I click on filters here, you'll notice this leaf. And first of all, I wanna give a shout out to all the identifiers that are already on this call because I know there are a lot of you who are already doing this. So thank you very much. Um, but especially if you're new to making identifications, Starting with the unknown category is a really great way to start. And what this brings up is all the observations that came in without an initial ID. Sometimes it's because people are new to iNaturalist and they didn't realize that they should put in an identification or they just really didn't know what something was, so they didn't choose anything. It can also happen, um, sometimes it even happens to me if I'm in the field and I'm making observations really quickly. Um, I will, they'll end up unknown and somebody IDs them for me. But these observations are kind of sitting in this pool without getting a lot of attention from experts. So a great way to participate with identifications is to go in and click on them. And you can give it 
a really coarse identification such as bird or plant. So I want to take, I want you all to participate right now and go ahead and fill, put into the chat um, how you would ID this and it might be plant. To me, it looks like a sweet pea, but I don't know for sure. Um, so we'll just kind of go through some of the observations and just shout out how you would identify them. Flower and plant, that's a, a designation I give to a lot of things. If I know it has a flower, but I can't get to a family or genus, I'll just call it a flower and plant. And it will put it before people who have more specific taxonomic knowledge. This one I'm gonna say is actually a little tricky because it's not really focused on any one thing. So I would probably give it a general des designation of plant. Um, I see in the chat veg, and I'm assuming that was for the last one. Um, so all of you out there, you are really well placed to identify observations because you have very specific local knowledge of your environment. And so you can go, in, I'm gonna go back to the filters you can actually set a place here and, and it might be your town or if your um, particular natural area has a place set up, you can put that in. If it's something you really know, you can do a lot of identifications for that. I know close to where I live, um, some of the naturalists at Eaton Canyon are very involved in identifying local biodiversity also select a place up here at the top and you can choose a specific taxa if you are skilled in bees or you are skilled in salamanders you can type that in and you can put broader things here into um, your the chat um, like plants snakes and um, reptiles amphibians things like that and another thing that I really want to highlight, and we really pay a lot of attention to in the City Nature Challenge, is captive and cultivated observations. So while we encourage everybody to make wild observations, it's inevitable that a lot of observations will come in as um, captive or cultivated. And many of you probably already know what those terms mean. In terms of iNaturalist, captive is an animal that's living from, um, in captivity. It's being supported by people. So your pets, farmyard animals, um, zoo animals, and cultivated refers to plants that are either planted or maintained by people. So anything growing in your garden, other than say weeds, which just come up on their own, city trees, plants and restoration areas. Now I've clicked on this link um, that shows the, um, specifically shows observations that have already been labeled as captive or cultivated. And we encourage everybody to do that because that makes us all good data stewards. And it cleans up the data for researchers who want to use this information that is being provided and um, means that these things won't become research grade and they won't make it into many of those scientific studies or the Global Biodiversity Information Network uh, or facility. I'm going to click on a couple of these here and just put in the chat why you think it might have been um, labeled as captive or cultivated. I'm going to say this one is very obviously growing in a garden at maybe a church or a university. It's part of the landscaping, Elliot says. And this is a good faith judgment. Um, if it's obviously captive or cultivated, please mark it. And anybody can do that. There's a little box right here that you can mark it as captive or cultivated. You can also, when you go into the observation and look at data quality and where it says organism is wild, you can click on no for that as well. And this one here, um, I can see a sprinkler right next to it. Um, which is telling me that it's captive or cultiva cultivated. This is a little tougher. I want to go ahead and put in the chat your thoughts on this mallard. I want to see, first of all, do people, um, for working on the last observation, wherever mulch has been placed is a good clue that something's captive or cultivated. Um, tell me what your thoughts are on a mallard in this situation. 
it's, you know, a widespread species, but it, it may be living in captivity. I don't know if it have its wings clipped. I probably wouldn't have marked this one personally because it probably is in the wild. Um, Karen here is noticing though that there's concrete in the foreground and tiles. So this really looks like a domestic park situation. And when we're talking about trees that are growing in parks or landscape plants, I would definitely go captive or cultivated. But this mallard probably has an opportunity to fly from one place or another. So again, on this one, I might actually go with wild instead of captive cultivated. And um, so that's just a brief taste. Thank you everybody for putting your thoughts into the chat. I really hope that you will give identification a try if you haven't done so already. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and turn it over to Elliot. Uh, first, Amy, this is amazing. Thank you so much for all of that insight. Um, second of all, I am blown away by the participation of naturalists and stewards in the city nature challenge that is just incredible um i will i want to um give z uh has their hand up so z if you want to ask a quick question you can come off mute sorry that was for the one of the questions with the mallard oh yeah put it down. <laughs> sorry um yeah, so we have a couple of really interesting questions um, in the chat. Um, the one that I kind of wanted to jump to first, Amy, um, was about cultivated and captive. Um, and this, and the reason why I wanted to bring it up, and I'm kind of glad someone else said it in the chat too. They kind of wanted to bring it up too. Um, a few of our partners are on um, like botanical gardens or things like that. And one of the things I hear that come up are, and, and sorry, even if it's not a botanical garden, it might be a reserve where they are planting native species. So um, the question is, is, is there value in uploading those as cultivated with the idea that they're still having interaction with the habitat, right? Like if we have a plant that is intentionally put in the ground, um, is there value beyond it just being there? Um, be, you know, with that idea that it is interacting with the habitat. Does that make sense, that question? <laughs> it absolutely does. And this comes up all the time. And um, the first thing I want to say is that even though for the City Nature Challenge and in my Office um, of Community Science, we really encourage wild observations, um, captive or cultivated observations are allowed iNaturalist doesn't ban them. They have a box just for that. So you're not technically breaking anyone's rules to do that. It's just important to mark it as such. And I know that there are a lot of people out there that will do surveys of specific areas um, to, you know, see, like, we have a restoration project going on. How is that changing the biodiversity over time? Is it drawing different plants and different animals in? Is it drawing in pollinators? And there are even some projects on iNaturalist that really focus on like plant pollinator interactions. So I don't necessarily put cultivated plants in myself a lot, but um, it's perfectly valid to put that in and um, even, you know, you can kind of link it to an observation with the pollinator because I know that I've been approached by people um, with some of my insect photographs asking if it was one type of flower or another. And this, I get IDs on my observations going back six years. Sometimes I can remember, but sometimes I can't tell from the picture if I had actually uploaded the plant at that time then I'd really know. And I'd have I'd probably have better pictures of the plant focusing on the different parts of it. Then I could give that researcher more information about it. I hope that answers the question. No, that does. Um, I just, I feel like it's um, like almost stigmatized for myself putting mm -hmm. up a, a cultivated plant. And even mm -hmm. if it's a native one in my backyard, like what you just said. Um, yeah, that's really good to hear. Um, Karen, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah. Thank you, Elliot. Um, Amy, thanks for the presentation. I'm sorry I came in a wee bit late, but um, this whole captive cultivated thing intrigues me and partly because of the implications for data. So I actually have two, a two part question for you. If we, if one enters captive cultivated with an, with an observation on iNaturalist, does it segregate it from the rest of the data? Could you explain that a little bit more clearly? Yes. So, um, 
you've probably noticed on your own observations that there are basically three ways an observation be, can be categorized. Something is casual, which often means that it doesn't have a photo or a sound with it. Maybe something else is off, it's missing a location. Um, there's needs ID, which puts it into that great pool of observations that are waiting to be identified as species. And often if something has IDs at the, um, the family level, you know, it'll still be in that needs ID pool. And then there's research grade, which means it has a community consensus of at least two thirds of the people who have offered an identification agreeing on what that is. And so a lot of researchers will pull, they'll do an export specifically pulling research grade observations um, and research grade observations go into the GBIF, Global Biodiversity Information Facility. They also go into other databases like CalFlora and I think a lot of other databases that I'm not even aware of, some research grade observations will go there. So in terms of keeping data clean, marking something as captive cultivated is really effective because even if two people agree on what it is, they'll say it's, it's a bird of paradise and somebody else says it's a bird of paradise. And if it's not marked captive cultivated, those two are enough to make it research grade. But as soon as something is marked as captive or cultivated or not wild, it automatically becomes a casual observation. And so then um, it won't go to CalFlora, it won't go to GBIF, and researchers probably won't be pulling it either. Okay, thank you for that explanation. And then more of an observation, I, it's interesting, the captive cultiva cultivation category, clearly animals that are, or beings or creatures that are able to move from place to place can be found in a domestic cultivated quote unquote setting, but can still be potentially wild animals um, or non-domesticated animals. And I think it's really important to include those in the higher databases and not make an assumption. And maybe I'm stating the obvious, but I think it's really important to consider that especially those of us that are living in urban environments are living in you know, highly regulated artificial environments that do have animals, uh, salamanders, lizards, what have you, occupying the space, but they're not necessarily, they're not captive animals. So that's where it gets a little dicey for me. It's an interesting thing to think about. Thank you. Sure um, Susan, you can go ahead next. Hi, Amy. This is wonderful. Um, you might know me as squirrel bait. I do. I, I enjoy all your identifications, especially I keep, you know, that I tell people about your daughter post. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm just, I'm, I'm so, I, I need to go out hiking with you one day. Indeed, we should do that. We should. And one of the things that probably, you know, as you know, I do a lot of work up at Eaton Canyon where I'm one of the docent naturalists. And one of the issues is we have a lot of schools in the neighborhood that will come out and do observations. <clears throat> and one of the students will make an ID and then right mm. behind them, five other students will come along and it's an incorrect ID. And then it becomes really hard to get it corrected. They're, they're calling, you know, uh, the, the chaparral yucca, <clears throat> a pallid yucca that occurs in Texas, not here. And it's so hard to get the, the observation, um, the identification to change. Any suggestions on something like that? That is really hard because I've seen that come up a lot in the forum as well. And um, I've personally had people reach out to me when I have what we call a maverick um, identification. Maverick doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. It just means it doesn't match the majority of people who are responding. And they will, they'll actually, you know, they'll in, in mail me um, saying, hey, can you withdraw that observation or not the observation, sorry, can you withdraw that identification? Because that way, then it actually can go to research grade with all these other IDs. And so all I can really offer is communication, but I know that with schools, um, you know, students may not be checking in regularly um, to see what people are saying. So that's something that we, we talk about at the museum when we're talking to teachers 
and educators who want to use iNaturalist is that part of that is making sure that you're um, being good data stewards and, you know, working with your class on that. And so sometimes if you probably don't know who the educator for that class is, but maybe even having a conversation with them, or if you happen to catch schools coming in um, and can talk about it before they start making observations, they don't just take the first thing or even the fifth thing that comes up in the AI feature. Yeah, so we, we have been reaching out to local schools because one of the things we have, I don't know if you've seen it, is the Eaton Canyon Biodiversity Project on a naturalist. So we encourage schools to go out and before you go, see what you're going to find in the canyon. And then That's when you great. get there, rather than going like, well, there's a plant. I have no idea what it is. You're going to go, oh, oh my gosh, that's a chaparral yucca. Look at that. Mm -hmm. And then they have, in, it's, it's a reward. Yeah. So that's one of the things we do, but we still have that issue. But thank you. You're welcome. I look forward to taking a hike with you one day. Sounds good. Um, Amy, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Amy, this was such a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think we need to have you back on at least once a year to cover <laughs> City Nature Challenge results and everything. Um, a really quick moment. If you haven't done so already, please click out, click um, in the chat box, click on the uh, survey form. This helps us make cones even better for next time. Not that it could get much better than this. Um, please take a moment to click in to our conference information page, which is coming up October 7th through 9th up in Tahoe City. We're really excited to see all of you. Um, that last link is the link to City Nature Challenge. Um, I also put in Amy's email contact if you have any questions to reach out directly. Amy, thank you so much. This was amazing. It was a pleasure. I'm so glad to be with my people. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And uh, we'll see you for the next Cones installation and hopefully up at Tahoe for our, uh, for our conference in October. Thank you all. Bye.